how we flipped open our Moleskine notebooks and you would start with, I got to figure out how to get rid of clients. And I would start with like, hey, I need to pick up another client or two. <laughs> and yeah, you were like at 60 and I was at like six. I'll give um, you 17 clients for a player to be named later. <laughs> Welcome to Obsessed Show, a podcast that is designed to inspire, featuring some of the most creative people in the world. I'm your host, Josh Miles. Let's talk about today's episode. Today on Obsessed Show, I've got another Indianapolis guy back to back. I am speaking with one of my best friends in the entire world, Tori Dolly. Tori has a background in design and branding, and although I'm sure we'll talk about some design and branding stuff today, uh, Tori has a new program that he is working on to help people launch solopreneur careers. And we're gonna unpack even what he means by that word, something that I certainly resonate with. Uh, I'm excited for the first time to have Tori on the show here with me back in my living room studio. So if you are listening on the audio only version, check out the YouTube as well over at youtube.com slash Josh Miles. So without further ado, please welcome Tori Dolly. Tori, welcome to Obsessed Show. Good to be here, bro. This has only been like years in the making. Yeah, yeah, it's taken a little while, but we fixed it. Remember that time a couple of years ago when you were like, I'm going to buy all the podcasting gear and then we're going to do a regular podcast. Yeah, I think that was like two years ago. <laughs> How many podcasts have we recorded? I, I think it's zero. I think. <laughs> I think we did like a Zoom call and maybe one of us hit record on that and maybe the other, maybe me, didn't record my end. Uh, so that was great. <laughs> um, we're, we're not doing great on this, but we're, we're going to make up for it here. I hope. Let's do it. <laughs> Let's try. So one of the places that I always like to start on Obsessed Show is Origin Stories. Um. And I have a feeling yours is going to start on a roof or something, but, um, tell us a little bit about how you found your way into the world of design and creativity and branding and, and now solopreneurship. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I think it started pretty early. I mean, I was always kind of creative, you know, the art thing when I was young, uh, drawing and writing. Um, and I always had this thing with anything that I drew, which was a lot of, you know, fighter jets and motorcycles you know this was the era of top gun and dirt bikes and that was exciting stuff right um totally rad totally <laughs> so i i would put type on things all the time i mean it was just fun to play with that you know and I, I also had a love for learning from very early on um sort of a collector mindset you know where i just like it could be like the animal kingdom you know i would just get um to use a term you like obsessed over certain topics and take a deep dive into understanding them. And then I would try to kind of translate that into some sort of creation or something in the art, you know? And so I kind of formed that connection between, I think, conceptual thinking and unpacking an idea and then turning that into something, you know, kind of expressive or at least building something new out of that. And, you know, at the age of nine, I had no idea <laughs> that that was like pretty much what I do now as an adult. Uh, it's kind of funny. So, um, so yeah, you know, got to the high school age and I loved writing. I mean, writing really truly has been my gateway into what I do now. And even early on, it was my gateway into design. I narrowly avoided disaster of going to a small private college for writing, uh, a college that has since failed <laughs> and that would have just been <laughs> a nightmare material. So, um, so instead I was encouraged to follow, um, a path towards design and went to Ball State University, uh, who had a fantastic design program, um, and just really enjoyed my time there. I mean, they're, they're fantastic professors, really great facilities, and they really taught me the basics of what most people would traditionally consider graphic design. But I also picked up a lot of critical thinking skills there, and they really kind of helped me expand what I had learned in my, in my expressive writing as well. And so, you know, I got after it in college and just put my name out there and promoted myself like crazy. This is pre-internet portfolio days. I mean, this is, to, to put this in perspective, we are an hour north of Indianapolis at the time. There was not a single bookstore in Muncie, Indiana, where I went to college. So that's it, so crazy. It, I mean, it's wild to think because 
back then, you know, as a designer, you're looking for inspiration. You're looking for visual items that you can kind of learn from and emulate or, you know, study. You had to go to Indianapolis an hour away and find the old design books or subscribe to, you know, what was it, print or how or whatever, mm -hmm. which we all right. did or com arts. Um, and that was the only source of, you know, the ability to inspire yourself and like learn and grow. So, you know, I look back at the pieces that we created in college sometimes and I'm like, oh my God. And yet I'm thinking, yeah, but we also had zero references and like mm -hmm. literally no teaching on how that process worked. And so anyway, you know, that's something I talk to students about all the time. It's like, you got to get out and look at, look at work and figure out what you think is, is good work. So ultimately go look at good work, but it's got to start by seeing what are people doing period? What are the things that you resonate with? And then trying to understand what that is. That's right. I, I mean, I think of any other type of creative endeavor, man, like music, imagine picking up the guitar, which, you know, we both play. Like if you, if you're picking up the guitar, trying to learn, yeah, you can learn the chords, you can learn the structures, but imagine not having all of that incredible music over the last 50 years, you know, in your head to give you ideas, to give you something to play, to yeah. learn and emulate. I mean, all of the old masters went through basically some form of apprenticeship to get where they were, where they were literally copying the technique of the masters. And that, I think that's still such an underrated tool when you're learning as a student. Obviously, I despise copying later as a professional. Yeah, right. You know, but, and even that's got a debatable, you know, angle to it that we're always going to have influences, whether we know it or not. Um, but I think there's a really giant canyon between inadvertently picking up ideas, collecting new ideas to help hone your thinking, and outright copying other people's material. Like, that's just gross. Yeah, right. Yeah. You know, it's the old Picasso, great art steel quote, um, which, which is never set well from with me on the surface level, but I, I love the kind of when you unpack it, like, okay, it's really not about literally doing exactly what they do, but you, you find elements of what other people are doing and then you kind of make that your own. And that's, that's what makes for really unique work. That's true. And that's exactly what he meant by that. And it's fast forward to today where I've had you know, 20 years of professional experience in the design and creative world. And now with what I'm doing online and seeing all these young kids and younger people throwing that quote out there and talking about in copywriting, how you steal. And I'm thinking it, it it's, a, it was appalling to me at first <laughs> to see it. I had to stop and remember, okay, they're young and they just, you know, people are not as, you know, they're dumb when they're young. I was too. Right. I get it. But, um, but I, I often stop them and go, this isn't what that is. I mean, I've, you know, when you're a creative professional, like you have to learn what that means when he said steal. And unfortunately, too many people took that literally. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we're working on that though. And, and they'll learn and it's okay. But um, I think back to finishing the story that you wanted me to tell on what my leap was here. Um, I promoted myself as much as I possibly could out of school to make sure that I could get in front of design uh, firms at the time and agencies. I targeted mm -hmm. Indianapolis and Denver because those were the two places that I was most interested in being. Um, narrowly avoided going to Denver, I actually had a firm quite interested at the time and ended up with an agency here in Indianapolis that I took um, and that kind of launched my career. So I was able to kind of get directly from school into the agency world and start working immediately. And that really opened up a lot of opportunities and doors for me because I had, you know, a fantastic art director, great peers, you know, people to kind of learn under and work and get my foot in the door. Um, I always knew, you know, my dad runs his own business. I come from a long line of entrepreneurial, very like self-sufficient freedom minded people, you know, and that was always a spirit of mine. I knew that I would start my own business. Um, but I had to get the experience first, you know, starting mm -hmm. from scratch with no experience is not a good idea as we know. Um, so that agency world was really interesting and a very, um, beneficial place to start from. I learned pretty quickly that that agency model was not ideal for me. Um, and it's funny, it's funny talking to you about this because we met I think when I had that job, in fact, I know it was when I had that job. I think we actually met when I was a student. Yeah. Portfolio Review Day. Yeah. <laughs> Shout out AIGA. <laughs> um, you know, yeah. And so you, you played a pivotal role in that. I mean, when I decided I'm not going to go into the circumstances of me leaving the first agency, but I will say it was um, abrupt and I didn't make the decision. Um, 
and I wasn't willing to sign something they wanted me to sign is the bottom line. And um, mm -hmm. they were doing what they thought was in their best interest for their business. And I was doing what was ultimately within the best interest of my career. And my art director and I both ended up leaving um, because of that. And I was kind of out to see for a minute, <laughs> you know, I, I mean, I took a stand for myself and then yeah. I'm like, uh, look around me at my network going, Hey guys, <laughs> uh, you got any like Mexican restaurant menus or anything? Like I'll take yeah, anything. Now I, what? Right. And you know, you played a pivotal role in that a couple other friends because I had built that network, you know, helped step in. And then I remember you reaching out and saying, Hey, I know this guy, he's trying to build his business. Um, I think you should talk to him. And so that was the next chapter, you know, working with somebody who was building from scratch. I was literally working in his spare bedroom yeah. as a designer. Um, and that that's really where I saw my career take off. Mm -hmm. You know, I spent about another year and a half there and helping someone else, not just do the design work, but also learn how to grow a small business and work directly with the client. Um, be part of all of those business discussions. You know, he was very open about business operations. I was involved in a lot of the client meetings and the strategy. We talked all the time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we had a good relationship. And so I got to kind of peel those layers back without it being all the pressure on me. But, and I didn't feel like a partner or anything in in that. I mean, it was very clear, you know, he was the leader of that. And I, mm -hmm. you know, I gained, I think the best way perhaps to say it is I gained a design mentor because he's absolutely brilliant with design and brand strategy. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I, like so blessed to work under a guy like that. And at the same time, I got to see the business side of the small business, you know, from the challenges and the benefits Yeah, and just help him there and kind of bring my own entre entrepreneurial spirit to that to help him grow. And so, um, I got to learn both of those in one swoop and you know that was that was a huge blessing for me um and you know we even expanded we brought in a couple other people to work under so I even then got a little bit of that kind of art director role you know down mm -hmm. as well um and again that really provided the foundation for my business in a lot of ways and then uh even from a from a client type perspective i mean you guys did a little bit in the commercial real estate commercial developer space which is a space that you've continued to to thrive in that's right. Yeah. He, you know, the opportunities that I had at that agency truly did set the foundation for everything I built my company on. Yeah. And in indirectly and directly. And so, yes, indirectly in the sense that I gained a ton of experience in the retail and the commercial real estate worlds. Um, so tactically, I learned all about brand strategy and solving yeah. client problems, all that. But then, you know, physically through the network. Yeah. I mean, we gained a ton from from being exposed to that. And then later on, um, to kind of tell that story, I guess, you know, what ended up happening is I had a client when I was at that agency and I really enjoyed the client. Um, she's a difficult client. <laughs> I've, I often told her like, I'm the only one that'll put up with you. <laughs> and that's why we, you know, work together. Um, wonderful human, one of my favorite humans on the planet. Um, and what happened is in the time that I left that agency, um, she had also left the client that the agency was serving and took a mm -hmm. new opportunity. And I don't, re I don't recall exactly how long it was, but months, you know, afterwards, whatever that time frame was, uh, you know, I had since started my own company after a brief stint with a total, not good idea. <laughs> um, it was a fun experiment. It was a fun experiment and it just didn't work out. That's okay. Um, still wonderful people, but we don't have to go into that. Um, and so you know, I went out on my own, started, and then, then that overlap kind of later. Which came. coincidentally was the first interview I had was with this, these same people. Is that right? Yeah, right Isn't out of school. I, I didn't get an opportunity there, but. Uh, I forgot about that. Yeah. Um, Interesting. Incredible designers. Oh, yeah. I'm going to. Genius. I'm gonna, yeah. yeah. I mean, like some of the best I've ever been around. Yeah. Yeah. Compliments out there for that. Um, but you got to be a good fit for people. And. I'm not a good fit for everybody. And <laughs> likewise, <laughs> you know, about that same time as you were leaving to launch your own thing, I'd been doing my own thing for a minute and, you know, was, you know, I, I say all the time because I don't have a better word for it in that I didn't start business with a grand plan of, okay, I'm going to grow to eight or 12 or 20 or 3000 people. I was just like, I'm going to go do it and find an opportunity and grow with that and see what makes sense. And for me, it felt, this is the word that I'm not sure if it's the right word, but I, I always say it was very opportunistic. And I think that's often a negative word, but for me, it was just literally, we're doing our thing 
and an opportunity to respond to an RFP shows up and maybe I respond, maybe I don't, or maybe we get a new project or maybe a client gets bigger and then we have to make a choice. Do we hire more people? Do we say no to the project and figure it out from there? So at this point in time, I think I was probably a five, six, seven person firm as you were getting launched with, with no sights on getting smaller ever, <laughs> you know, my, my thought was, well, we're, we'll just, uh, you know, we would often joke like, well, our plan is just to take over the world, which was not real. <laughs> uh, but it was just to like keep onward upward. And so you sort of launch your thing probably with a similar mindset. So, you know, foreshadowing here, I said in the introduction, we're going to talk about your solopreneur thing. So that does not sound like a big team, but, but how, how are you looking at starting business when you were getting started and how are you planning to shape and scale that yeah. company? Yeah. I think, um, <clears throat> I think it was in a similar idea that you had when starting. I mean, you know, we were coming up in the era of, and, and I, I guess that era maybe is still around, but you know, you think we went up to Minneapolis to visit Duffy and partners, you know, yeah. like we, we took a lot of students through AIGA to all their creative shop. Oh, I mean like top of the line right? yeah, in like 1%. the coolest area ever of right. that Very city. Retail. Oh, it's where target and best buy and you know, all the brands that were big in the consumer space right then that were cool, that were tech and food and beverage and all of that stuff. Like he was doing lots of really great stuff. Yeah. I mean, they were, they were literally top three in my like mind, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? If not the top, I mean, just the, the way that they approached the work, the way they talked about how their team operated, who they served, the work they were putting out. And so, you know, you go out and you see those teams and you really, and, and, you know, again, I think, I think it might've been 10 people at the time, mm -hmm. you know, um, but you know, exposed brick walls and glass, you know, walls that go up to three stories and let the light in and like steel beams and coffee machines. And, you know, that just, they were just awesome. They were cool, yeah. you know? And so you see that as a young designer there, that that's like, I'm going to build a business. Um, it was never like a big advertising agency, you know, own the 12th floor or something of a building or whatever. It was more that like design studio. That's super cool. Um, so I had that idea for sure. I mm -hmm. mean, I thought that's what, you know, we would do going out of the gate. Um, and so when I did finally start, you know, it was that classic path of at first it sucked because you're trying like crazy to get good work, any work, you just had to make money. And, you know, I still, I think, thank you to this day for giving me your table scraps, <laughs> having a few years ahead Which of me. Which may have actually been a Mexican restaurant menu. I, I know I did for one, I'm positive. <laughs> I just don't remember for who, but it might've yeah, been from you. One of the two menus that my, my agency ever did. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you're welcome. I provided a lot of value for that. Uh, anyway, so yeah, I think that um, going into that idea, you know, and then, and then landing the bigger clients, you know, that started pretty quickly, you mm -hmm. know, is, is I had some good contacts, some good networks and some good history working with some of these bigger people and Hey, they remember. So when they go take a new job, yeah. they go, Hey, you did a great job for me back then. I want to bring you in. And so the next thing I know, I'm 26 years old, sitting across the conference room table from a CEO and COO of, uh, at that time, $500 million company. Yeah. And I walked out of that meeting with, you know, my first big contract. And I think if I recall correctly, it was like $38,000. And to put that into perspective, that was not that much less than my entire salary yeah. at the previous place. Previously. Right. <laughs> and I mean, like they needed a, a lot of work. And so that just kind of sprung everything. And another big deal about landing a client like that is it shows you can handle a client like that. Mm -hmm. And so I did, you know, I took care of everything they needed. Well, other big companies notice that too. And they have friends in other big companies. And by the way, these companies have departments and you become known in one department and then the development department hears about you and they go, well, we're building this new retail center and it needs signage and branding yeah. and you know, all of these other components, we have a budget for that. That's like landing a whole other client, except it's all under one roof. And so the side effect of that is I'm up until 2 a.m. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm up again at 6.30 a.m. every day, working nonstop with clients who really valued the meetings quite mm -hmm. a bit. So yeah, right. I prayed for 5 p.m. every day to show up. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I, 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 that's when my work began yeah. is how it was back then. And thinking yeah. about it now, it's like chaos, dysfunction. Right. And so, of course, your natural inclination is I need help. 
Mm -hmm. And it, you're you're immediately the central star of the E Myth book. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, here it is in real life. Tori is starring in the E Myth. Time um, to bake some cakes. <laughs> right, exactly. Only I make design work instead of delicious cakes, like Sarah. I think her name was Sarah. Anyway, <laughs> um, it's been a while since I read that book. So yeah, I need designers, right? So I went out with absolutely no criteria, no real ability to discern from great or not. Yeah. Um, and found some, you know, really, I mean, ultimately incredible designers, you know, there were, I had two people full time under me at one point, mm -hmm. both incredible designers, you know, incredible skills. I sucked as a manager. I didn't know how to transition into leadership, sales, marketing, managing, managing the clients and getting the work done to the specs that you know, I wanted or communicating to them what needed to be done or how, um, yeah. team, I mean, all of the things now that I help people do, <laughs> it all came from this like horrible pain of learning that all the hard way that I didn't want that. And that was what I, and you know, sometimes you have to figure that out by mm -hmm. getting it and going, well, that didn't, you know, turns out I don't like sushi. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I do. I love sushi, but you know, you, like you have to try it sometimes and it, mm -hmm you know, is remarkably painful. I mean, to be quite blunt about it, um, letting go of the employees that I had, I would rank absolutely in the top three most painful events of my life. Mm. Like it, I hated that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, it sucked. And, you know, you kind of go, I don't ever want to do that again. Yeah. Um, and so after that experiment, which I think took about two years to unfold, and meanwhile, my balance sheet started out with tens of thousands of dollars in savings, which I'd never had before in my life after working my butt off for a year or whatever on my own. Yeah. Um, to being over a hundred thousand dollars in debt, not paying myself for months and yeah. months. I mean, that was while you had a team. Yeah. 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 They, I never missed a single paycheck for them. Right. I mean, they, I made sure they were paid no matter what every single time until the absolute unmost, like there's no drop left to ring out of this thing. Yep. Um, I mean, insanity when I think back, you know, of like, Hey kid, <laughs> yeah, dummy. Right. But yeah, you keep I went thinking. through the same thing twice in the cycle of my agency, um, where we were paying ourselves less sometimes, you know, skipping one and trying to catch up or whatever, but it was like, but nobody else got cuts. Yeah. Yeah. It's horrible. It is. It's horrible because the whole time you're like, I'm responsible for them. Yeah. You care less about your own. Like I'll eat hot dogs all day. I don't care. Like <laughs> <laughs> just whatever. Um, and, and yet you, you also bear this responsibility as the quote unquote owner. Mm -hmm. And the whole time you're going, I pulled them into this and I'm failing and I'm failing them and I'm failing me. And it, it's just, it's a, it's a terrible feeling. It sucks. Right. It's horrible. And I, I think it's probably important to maybe map out this contrast because it does flavor why I went the direction that I did Yeah. and why going through that pain was so beneficial to me over time. And then why now fast forward, um, to today when the model that I decided to build back then as a result of that failure, um, is now, <laughs> dare I say it, becoming the norm. Um, in fact, that's, you know, my new tagline, which I've trademarked is the future belongs to the solopreneur. Mm -hmm. And I, I believe that wholeheartedly for a number of reasons, which we may not get into, but, um, maybe before we dig into that, the, the other thing that was really unique about your business that happened even before and after the team was, and you kind of implied this for a second, which is working for massive companies like your first big one, um, you shaped your, your client set very opposite of what I had done and not by intention, but I, my firm often worked with, uh, you know, 20 or 30 key clients throughout the year with 60 clients contributing to billings throughout the year. So like hosting and little insignificant things, but still the 60 different clients who might hit me up with an email at any point during the day, uh, times every day. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and, and you built your business very differently with just a handful of clients. Was, was that an intentional move for you? Yeah. Yeah. It was pretty early. So this, this is funny. Um, so you're bringing me back to our, 
weekly morning breakfasts at A to Z Cafe over a bowl of oatmeal that should have fed a small army. Loaded with brown sugar. Right. And this butter. is pre-keto. Yes. <laughs> Days. Um, talking about how we flipped open our Moleskine notebooks and you would start with, I got to figure out how to get rid of clients. And I would start with like, hey, I need to pick up another client or two. <laughs> and yeah, you were like at 60 and I was at like six. I'll give um, you 17 clients for a player to be named later. Know, right? like, <laughs> that's Yeah, we should have had like a, a, a total draft agreement here. Um, it's like a money ball scene. Oh, man. Uh, yeah, I I knew early on. I recognized in particular, and and again, this is going back to that one key client that I picked up and how I tease about her being a pain in the butt. But, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not kidding in that she would have been happiest if I was sitting next to her all day, every day for eight hours so she could just feed things off of me and get, you know, feedback and be like, okay, cool, we'll do this, we'll do this, sure. we'll do this. Yeah, no, and I'm like, well, we're not making any progress, you know, but <laughs> at least you feel good about it. Um, well, I mean, it's tough when somebody is not necessarily used to working with an agency partner or an outside design team, they're used to having employees and staff. Exactly. And so they start to, you know, not to any fault of their own, but they're treating you like, uh, like you work there. Exactly. Which and is so by they the way, wanna, like, Hey, Hey, you get a minute. Hey, let's have a meeting. Hey, can we jump on a call? Hey, can you pop down here? Yes. Yeah. And, and you couple that with another layer where you are sort of her, um, you're her ammunition, you're her backup strategically oh, right. uh -huh. because she's also, you know, remember she landed a whale here, you know, in being yeah. the marketing director of a massive company that just went public, you know what I mean? And so she's looking at me going, uh, you're kind of my expertise here, you know, right. I need you. And so this is a big threat to and, solo partners. And you need this client. Oh yeah. <laughs> Cause oh, yeah. we need each other. <laughs> nearly your only. <laughs> yeah. And at that point, that's true. You know, they were probably 60%, 70% of my billing at the time. Yeah. And so I learned early that the client will soak up a lot of your time. <laughs> and mm -hmm. again, I don't want to imply that it was a waste by any stretch. I mean, it was, it was never like menial, useless discussion. Yeah. It was just that it turned into a problem because we couldn't act on it fast enough, mm -hmm. you know, which again, I'm keenly aware of that they didn't hire an agency. They hired me. Yeah. Now, granted, they're getting twice the quality and amount of work for the same thing because I don't have all the overheads that they have, but I yeah. hadn't at the time quite yet figured out. In fact, at that time, I hadn't at all figured out how to build my network like I do now where I could expand mm -hmm. and contract on demand. So again, my idea was, well, I need help. So I hired, but anyway, um, back to the idea of volume, mm -hmm. having kind of known that in my back pocket, like how am I supposed to keep up with all of this? So I decided that I could focus and, and by the way, I should shout out too to the previous design firm. And what I learned from working with him, you mm -hmm. know, is I saw that happening in real time, you know, that it's yeah. tough to juggle 20 clients. And so I decided that, okay, I think what I'm going to do here is kill two birds with one stone. I'm going to cut down on the amount of correspondence by dealing with one client, but that means they have to be a bigger client. I mm -hmm. need more money from them and bigger budgets all the time. Well, I had that with the first client by having this name on my ledger and that network open to me and the proof that I could handle that volume of work that made it easier for me to go find these other massive clients who are like, well, if they trust you, <laughs> you know, I can trust you. Right. And so I capped it. I don't remember exactly when, but I capped it at eight. I said I would never have more than eight clients. And my idea of the ideal distribution of that was something like three big ones mm -hmm. that could equally sort of weigh along my, you know, uh, income and then three mid size that were more formulaic that I could kind of handle more efficiently. And then two that were up and coming or budding or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, and that would kind of satisfy those needs. I would have that steady income, the bigger accounts. And I would also have those cool little accounts, like, you know, the brewery that was starting back then. Now that is nothing at all novel, but back then this was before every yeah. single, you know, street on in America had a brewery. <laughs> so, um, you know, you just thought in those terms that, mm -hmm. okay, now that takes care of the really hot craft stuff in my portfolio and I'm also making good money. And again, at first it was, I'll build a team to support all this ultimately. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, yes, capping that was de definitely deliberate. And I still recommend now for solopreneurs that that model, when you're providing a professional service is absolutely the way to go, because unless you have a, a unless you have a product or a service that is really close to a product, you're going to get eaten alive in the correspondence alone. Yeah, right.
And our, our work is such that it's not them going, I want X, here are the parameters for X, and here's the budget. And we come back with like, cool, I can give you X. That's not how we work. They come to us and they go, we have an issue in this market with this demographic and these sales numbers. We got to figure this out. What do we do? Mm -hmm. Well, that's very different. <laughs> so, you know, it, it's important for me to be able to give the time to those customers too, to make sure that we're digging up the strategies that need to be implemented and actually create the goods at the end. So, uh, you know, if you're going to do that model and you also don't want to build an empire of 50 people, math is math. Right. So when, uh, conventional wisdom today, most agencies, they want to grow, they want to add new clients. They want to, you know, get one more like this other one that they have, they would do a series of things like maybe enter their best work into an award show. You're they might, up, they <laughs> might, uh, run ads for themselves. Yeah, they yeah. might do some sort of marketing. They might do social media push. They might do email marketing. Uh, you have sort of famously refused to do any of these things. <laughs> Yes. How, true. how did you find yourself scaling from one client to the next or not even scaling, but when you needed that client to go in addition to your first whale, how did you find your way into the next door by, uh, doing your best to not be seen at the same time? <laughs> yeah, I did. I did famously kind of do this kind of vanishing act while also suddenly maintaining clients that all these other agencies were trying to claw away yeah. from me. Who is doing that work? Uh-huh. Yeah. I ran into that a lot. Um, well, I, I mean the, the short answer is I prioritize relationships over everything else, period. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was about just expanding my network on a very personal level and finding people who needed those problems solved and weren't being served. Mm -hmm. And when you strike up a conversation with those people and talk to them about their problems and their needs and describe possible solutions without hitting them with the sale, yeah. it's amazing how receptive people are to that. And when you know what you want, you know what you do well, and you know who you can help, you don't need a hundred people and mm -hmm. you're, you know, plus by the way, retention isn't an issue. My average client relationship is 11.3 years. I did the numbers. 11 right it's now so of, ridiculous yeah, and impressive in a, in a market that averages probably around 18 months yeah on in general from all the agencies yeah, where the to. the average tenure of a cmo is like not even a year and a half <laughs> so like you probably see client your contact cycle through five times <laughs> over the course of your relationship or more yeah yeah i have but you hold on to the client that's right and of all of the clients over the years, and again, I started in 2006, I think it's important to probably anchor that time, like for yeah. just to keep that in perspective, um, the iPhone wasn't even a thing <laughs> really. Right. So, um, this is very, a very different world back then till now of what I built. But, um, yeah, it's a funny thing about clients who hold high level CMO positions and even mid-level marketing, they go to other companies, they mm -hmm. get promoted, they go to different departments and they bring you with. And yeah. the person who's at the department that fills in after that person leaves goes, well, you're the person that's taking care of this. Let's get up to speed. Yeah, cool. Let's keep working. Right. That's, I mean, that is the, or the type of organic growth I've experienced over time. And so when you think about some of my larger corporate clients, um, I think if I haven't considered this, but I think every one of them has either moved once and definitely has changed positions. You know, there's, mm -hmm. uh, I, I have one client in particular who is, I mean, it's absolutely a household name and I did work for another one of the departments and then she left that division of this household name to join their other larger household name mm -hmm. and, you know, was able to do work there too. And it's just that, that kind of, when you, when you position all of your services towards those type of people and get immersed in that network and get involved in that network and talk to that network and solve the problems for that network. Mm -hmm. They evangelize you to the end of the freaking planet. Yeah. And so that's effectively how I avoided. I mean, again, I've, yes, I famously have kind of said that I was able to build, build the millions that I have built without spending a single dollar on marketing or a single minute in sales. Mm -hmm. And I get pushback there because people will be like, you're always stealing. And I'm like, I'm talking about formal capital S sales. Yeah. Or capital M marketing. Mm -hmm. We are always selling in marketing. And by the way, I was, and I want to bring up actually back to a, a word that you used opportunistic. Yeah. I love that word. In fact, most successful people I know 
that's a core characteristic I notice of them is they're mm. opportunistic constantly. This is so, so like, for example, we, for, all right, we have some income from real estate. Anybody who's ever thought about getting into real estate, rental homes, you know, vacation rentals, whatever, they can't travel without like driving around and researching, you know, right. looking, I wonder if there's any homes here for a good deal. It's like, right. a, it's like a disease, you yeah, know, what's the market like here? Yes. Like it's a thing. That's a form of opportunism where you're just like, mm -hmm. I can't not think about any opportunities that might be in front of me, you mm -hmm. know? And I mean, that, that was me to a T all the time with my clients. So I think that's really important as a designer, as a professional creator, because they don't sit down and just like ideate all the time. They're drowning. Mm -hmm. Their boss is throwing a million things at them to just get done. They don't have time to sit there. That's the single biggest problem that most of my clients face. They don't have time to stop and like strategize. That's why I do it for them and help them. Right. And that's a form of opportunism. When you come in and say like, hey, I noticed you have this problem. I came up with a solution for it. Do you want to hear about it? <laughs> Who says no? Right. And so I think that that's been a critical part of me avoiding those sort of um, typical frameworks of, you know, get the exposure with the design shows, make sure you can say you're award winning. But, I mean, my website, I didn't even create a formal, actual, legitimate website until I realized that one of the clients that I had, which by the way, I picked up because a person that I had served at another company got a really great role at this new company who is fantastic in building literally like global award-winning projects. Mm -hmm. When I went over and started working with them, I realized for his reputation as a new person, somebody there was probably going to ask, well, who's this Tory guy you're working with? I should right. probably put something online yeah. that he can point them to and be proud of. Um, that's the only reason I put up any design work. Yeah. It, it's still horribly inept. I haven't touched it forever. There's a hundred projects I could put on there, but I yeah. never used it for marketing and therefore the priority just didn't exist. Yeah. You do finally have some gorgeous examples of, of things that you've oh, done. Thanks. You do exist. I, I, uh, I've heard. You I, got past the, the Santa Claus uh, <laughs> portion of the show. Um, and, and so ultimately, you know, I think back, it was maybe two years ago, you came to me and said, I think I'm going to stop doing client work and start doing something else. I don't know exactly what it is. I want to start writing. I want to maybe launch a course. And, uh, and I see huge opportunity in that. Um, and then like what, six, eight months ago, you kind of did it. I mean, you're not a hundred percent out of the client work, but you're largely out of that space where you're not designing, doing brand work nearly at the scale that you were at the very least. Like you've hold on to, held on to a handful of projects and a handful of clients. Uh, but, but why? <laughs> I get that a lot. Yeah. Why would you do that? Um, <laughs> And I have since, I've since kind of actually revised my approach a little bit because mm -hmm. I do think it is really important while you're teaching and guiding, um, you know, to also still have your feet in the real world and the real yeah. market. And so my original idea was no, cut off everything. Mm -hmm. Um, and this is something you know about me well, my difficulty in compartmentalizing, <laughs> I have to live full throttle, 100% in the room I'm in. And then if I want to go to a different room, I will go out of that room, shut that door and then be a hundred percent in the next. Like I don't do well with, you know, I'll spend an hour there and then an hour there. Like it's yeah. hard for me. So I recognized that I was just pouring all of my life and soul into my clients. And that unless I stopped doing that, um, I wasn't going to be able to build this other thing. And so mm -hmm. in true maximizer fashion, you know, here I'm like, oh, I'm, I've, I've built the reserves that I can invest in myself and I'm just going to stop and then go focus on that. And <clears throat> turns out when you serve people for 15 plus years and are basically friends with them and are a valuable part of their company's profit <laughs> margin, they don't like it when you say you're not going to do work for them anymore. <laughs> And corporations are particularly bad about this because they'll add extra zeros to the end of numbers. And then you go, <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, that changes things. <laughs> so they've pulled out all their bag of tricks um, and have kept me around. But all that to say is it's been a slower transition process than I had predicted. Um, but like maybe this is an, an account growth strategy for, for our listeners. It's like, just tell your clients that you're done. You know, scarcity does drive desire, Josh. It's an important right. rule. Um, that a lot of people miss. So, um, uh, yeah, I have been able to get out of types of work with certain clients that I knew were going to just create issues. And that mm -hmm. also, frankly, wouldn't be fair to them if I didn't help them transition away from that. Sure. Um, but then 
the amount of time I've put into building what I'm building now, I mean, that has been, I, I feel like it's a, the client work is a side gig now to yeah. a certain extent. Well, it's, you're investing significant time in writing and especially in your involvement with Twitter and kind of growing an audience there. Uh, talk a little bit about what it is you're doing in the solopreneur space. So my entire mission kind of from this point forward, and again, from about a year and a half, really, mm -hmm. um, from then on, I kind of describe it as I want to help the next generation of solopreneurs learn what took me a long time to learn and to leverage opportunities they have now that I didn't have at the time, but that we do have now. And to learn how to build business models around the solopreneur framework mm -hmm. that actually can succeed, can actually serve high quality clients and can produce the type of lifestyle that you actually want to live. Because we all know that that's not a good fit for everyone. It doesn't make a good fit for every client. Right. And it ends in disaster all too often because it's not treated like a real true business endeavor, most specifically by the person operating it. Right. So I saw just a huge need there. And obviously our technology and our entire economic frameworks, I, I, the social industry, I, everything is moving that direction. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it hinges on this idea of decentralization. And you know what I leveraged, and I, maybe I should kind of backstory this up for a minute. I mean, the, the thing that I noticed when I had employees versus what I w went to afterward, there was almost epiphany level, is all the struggles that I had with the employee side, that again, were like 95% me. Um, I didn't have any of that when I brought in partners. Like right. I would bring in programmers, photographers, other designers, other writers who had their own job or were moonlighting or were doing their own freelancing and everything was smooth. Everything was easy. Yeah. I mean, the budgets were succinct. They got their work done on time. The quality was really high. They collaborated well together. Like I could pick exactly who was right for that job and base it on their strengths. Like mm. it didn't, it wasn't immediately apparent to me. Now I'm like, of course, idiot, you know, but like it wasn't apparent to me. And yet when it did sink in, I was like, why not just do that? Mm -hmm. So instead of paying W2 employees when there's no work or having W2 employees who have skills A, B, and D, but not C, and I have a client who has need C, and now what? I don't serve them as well. Yeah. Or I have to go get another person who is good at C and now that's expensive. Instead, I'm like, no, I just go out and find the person in my network who is like awesome at C. And by the way, that serves the client best. Yeah. And so that was the model that I decided to build. I call it the hub model back then. There was no word for solopreneurship sure. really back then. And I just call it the hub model. I'm like, I'm the middle and all the spokes are the people I bring in and I can expand and contract at any given time to meet the demands of the client. And that means that I can now tell clients that you guys don't have to conform to me and my agency. Mm -hmm. I conform to you and your problem. And we solve that. It turns out they like to hear that. Right. So, so that was the model. I bet. Well now, you know, fast forward now, man. And it's like the, again, it's so easy for anybody to form a team of people right now to solve problems. Mm -hmm. And if you just spent six months building a network of other people who fill in the gaps for you, you're an agency. I mean, you're literally an agency at that point. Now it's not apples to apples. There's a lot of challenges that you have to do that compared to what the agency does. Right. But at the end of the day, you can generate work that is 100% on par with the traditional agencies for a lot less money. And in an era where budgets are getting slashed, but expectations are not getting slashed, Guess who's going to win that game? Yeah. And by the way, all the people that the agencies lay off, guess who become now part of my network? Right. So it's, it's really a brilliant model for people to start using. And it most importantly, it's the fastest model for freedom in your own individual personal life. Now you can botch that real quick and become a slave to it. That, that's right. something I help people understand a lot. But if you build the model correctly, you now can get the constraints around your time where you're not a slave to any one of your clients and you're not a slave to your employees either. And now you can just operate your model the way you want, expand and contract. And that's 
that's so highly appealing to so many people right now, especially in a post COVID era where they got a little taste of that. Mm -hmm. They got to kind of work from home. They got to kind of make their own schedule. They got to collaborate. They got to skip like eight hours of meetings a week that were completely unnecessary (laughs) and got more done when they weren't in the office, you know, and technologies have made that easier than ever. I mean, look at Adobe, look at what they have made in terms of like collaborative, you know, follow along for, you know, feedback and sharing it with your clients or whatever, or even the tools like Canva or whatever, right? Like Mm -hmm. it's so easy for people to now exchange information, you know, Figma, all of the things that are out there that are highly collaborative and in the cloud, and not to mention something as simple as Zoom calls, being able to just collaborate together. There are different ways of working than in-person. I love in-person. Like I don't want to ever come across as like, I think that there's no benefit to that. Right. Um, but not at the price of becoming a, a slave as an employee or an employer. Yeah. So being a solopreneur is not about being an introvert or staying away from people or, or any of those things. It really is more about being independent sort of as, as the single business unit, you're just yourself, but then you're working with a myriad of people who you're not committed to on a everyday basis. You're not, you're not struggling to go get more work to feed everybody else. But when you get more work, you've got stuff to feed everybody else. That's a big part of it. Yeah. Yeah. I, the way I like to describe it is if you look at a traditional agency model and you add up, make everybody a little dot, you know, all the roles, right? Mm -hmm. Project managers, account reps, salespeople, designers, programmers, whoever, and you, they're all a dot and you put a big circle around them. And that big circle around them is agency. It's the entity. They all literally go to that building and and live there. And even if they work remotely, they're in the big circle. The circle goes outside of everybody. Yeah. In my model, you take those dots, all but you, and you move them outside of that circle. Mm-hmm. So you're in the circle, but now all of them are their own little circle. And you just draw lines to the ones you need when you need them. Right. And that has, again, its own set of challenges at times. But boy, are there are a lot of benefits. <laughs> and so that's the that's the model is it's not that. It's not that you're not operating or, or you're like radically operating differently than an agency. A lot of the same rules apply. That's what I'm teaching a lot of people because they want to go in and be like, well, I just kind of casually approach solopreneurship. And then they suddenly go down the trail of like every single like time management problem and overwhelm and feast and famine and like all these horrible afflictions yeah. that solopreneurs face all the time. Um, but when they learn to build it the right way, they learn how to manage all of those cycles and make sure that they are built in a way that's sustainable, that they can actually mitigate any of the like massive spikes by scaling appropriately and having Mm -hmm. resources for that. And they don't have to turn down great work, but also making sure that they're getting their pipeline filled so that they're not, you know, I got all this work and then they work hard for three months, neglect their pipeline. And then they go back and it's crickets and they're like, Oh God, what do I do now? You know, (laughs) like that's a terrible cycle. A lot of people get stuck in. Um, and there's easy ways to deal with that. Well, the interesting bit too, is, you know, you're sort of, talking about the dot in the middle being being us um but each of those dots could be their own solopreneur as well so like i'm a dot in your cluster your dot in my cluster which which is real <laughs> very real right yeah yeah so, and and again when you invite me into your circle then in that moment like when we're out working together that circles us, right? Like we we are that thing in that moment. It's just I get to step outside of that circle later when another friend, you know, invites me into their circle, or or right. when I bring you in, mm-hmm. you're in my circle in that context for a minute, and that's really that ebb and flow of those networks. As long as everybody kind of understands the rules of the game and what we're trying to get done, which again, if I win, <laughs> everybody's going to know how to do that. And I think people <laughs> are organically learning how to do that. I think that it's in the lexicon now, but. You know, it's worth pointing out that that's another thing that I really noticed is how highly collaborative so many of my experiences were. So like early on, you know, somebody like, you know, Maddie Bennett, who I love and adore and has been like a brother to me over the years, you know, he ran Sequences Design Forever, which was this really incredible um, design studio that focused a lot on like interiors and like he's responsible for like the interior design elements of, you know, some of the hottest restaurants and places in Indianapolis. I mean, mm-hmm. in some of the spaces, like just in, just a wonderful human, excellent work. And he noticed a need that he had with his clients on the branding side that he wasn't interested in fulfilling. And so he's like, bring, bring him on. 
Yeah. You know, and Maddie is there for me that, you know, if those clients show up, I can do that same thing. I have another, John Mitchell is another great example, a brilliant strategist in mind, you know, who's kind of working as a really high level leader now in another organization. But for a while he ran his own photography studio, mm -hmm. same deal, you know? So now I have a photographer videographer and he has a brand strategist and designer and we collaborated all the time. Yeah. And I was, those are the things I enjoyed the most. I loved that. And so, and I think some of the best work was created that way too, by the way. And so that's the kind of model that I love. And that's what you and I have now too, is it's, you know, basically we're just subsidizing our opportunities to hang <laughs> out, but you know, we're also creating some of the work that I'm like the most proud of and that I enjoy the most. Yeah. You know, shifting gears a little bit to the concept of coaching. Um, I've worked with a multitude of coaches over my career. And I, I think it was always time and money really well spent because it's so tough to get outside of your own jar and see what's on the outside. And, um, so you are both being coached at the moment and you're also coaching, uh, upcoming solopreneurs through their, their needs at the moment. What, what are some of the biggest challenges that, um, want to be, or, you know, blooming, blossoming <laughs> solopreneurs, what are, what are people running into as they're starting or trying to get, uh, off the, the plateau of where their, their business is at the moment? First, I think you hinted at it in that there's so much information out there right now. It is so difficult to discern between what is the best and what is just complete and utter nonsense. Yeah. Um, I don't know if anybody's noticed, but people will spout complete garbage very confidently online. <laughs> and so, um, making sure that I'm surrounding myself with the people who know what they're doing and have done it before and yeah. also help me get outside of my own head. That's always been important to me. I mean, again, I think back to our breakfasts and how we kind of determine that, like after right. what, four sessions, we would go back and forth with our challenges for each other. And every single complex, stupid challenge I had that I was wrestling with for a month, you were like, just do this. And I'm like, <laughs> that's brilliant. Like, how'd you, what? And then you would go and tell me about this thing. And I would just be like, well, just do that. And you're like, yeah. And I think we did that for like three or four times before <laughs> we were like, why don't we just tell each other what to do and right. save ourselves all of this nonsense? And it, 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 it's that Solomon's paradox idea, right? Like mm -hmm. that you can't get outside of your own head to see your own problems as clearly as you see other people's problems. Leverage it find a trusted partner and just hack the stupid thing, yeah. you know, and use it to our advantage. So we found that out earlier. Well, that led to hiring coaches and bringing people into my sphere going, look, if nothing else, I'm not, I'm probably not going to hear something I've never heard before. It's not that I need them to give me data. You know what I mean? I need their perspective in the moment that I need it mm -hmm. so I can get out of my own head and move faster. And the best coaches always do that. And that's what I'm doing now for other people. And so in specifically in the solopreneur space, when I look at the client's coming to me, I, the, the, most of the time, the problems center, there's a couple core problems, but one of them really is skill set. I mean, that's the fundamental. If you do not yeah. have a marketable skill that you can leverage and sell that can actually provide a solution to a problem that somebody is worth, that somebody is willing to pay for, mm -hmm. you can solve problems all day for people, but if they're not willing to pay for it, then it's not marketable and yeah. you can't start a business on that. So we're looking for that marketable skill. Yeah. Okay. So designer, photographer, you know, developer, you know, writer, all of those, like there's yep. a thousand of them. Um, once you have that down and you're good at it, the next big problem people face is sales income, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's just, I'm just going to go down the like one-on-one -on -one list. They need work. There is no other downstream problem if they don't have work. <laughs> right. So they immediately recognize that, Hey, I have a sales problem. You know, I need customers. And so that's where they get into the difficulty of like, okay, well, where do you find those customers and who are you looking for? Well, you got to figure out your target audience. You got to be different than all your, you know, competitors and figure out where your positioning is. You know, there's all that tangled right. mess and it all sounds, you know, we hear them all the time, but at the end of the day, the formula for that's not terribly complex. I find that people will wrestle with that for six months. Yeah. And I actually have started kind of using a joke. I actually want, I, I think I'm going to get one of my developer friends to make like this false, uh, slot machine. <laughs> it's literally, it's literally going to be like, uh, a market, like a skill and like a target audience. Mm -hmm. Um, and you're just, you're, you're going to pull the slot. And so when somebody says to me, like, I don't know who my target audience is. And I'm like, 
okay, well, what about restaurants? Well, I don't know if restaurants, whatever. Okay, well, what about, the, and they're just like, well, I don't know. It's like, well, if you don't know, then we're just going to pick one. Yeah. I mean, you pull the slot machine. Let's see what it comes up. Ooh, hair salons. <laughs> Boom. Okay. That's your target audience. There you go. Because you got to start somewhere and yeah. you can't get data unless you put something out there. So we can spin our wheels for six months trying to decide what that target audience is, or we can pick mm -hmm. an imperfect one and start talking to them and start figuring out what their problems are and solving their problems. And by the end of that six months, I guarantee you'll probably end up with a different market, but you are never going to get there if you didn't start. Yeah. So we got to figure out that target so we can start figuring out their problems, speak their language and tell them why we have a solution to their problem. So once you start to get the work coming in through the sales problem, now you immediately have a second problem as a solopreneur and that's production and operations. Mm -hmm. And this creates the feast and famine cycle, right? Yeah. Because you, you, you line up the clients, you bring in a batch and then guess what? You have to spread the mulch, buddy. <laughs> You're the one who has to do all the labor. So guess who's not out selling? Guess who's not out marketing, right? And that stuff is stinky once you start spreading it. <laughs> exactly. It's on the top <laughs> of my head. It's spring here and I just got that done last week. Right. I should have hired it out anyway. Um, so now you got to get all the work done. Mm -hmm. If you don't have your systems, your processes and your operations figured out and streamlined, which you're not going to at first, but you, you need to start thinking about it. You're mm -hmm. going to spend 40 hours on a 20 hour task. You're going to get stuck in your client correspondence because you didn't set the right communicative boundaries with them. And so I, I think that Again, I'm not going to make this like a crash course in these things, but the bottom yeah. line is sales is your first problem uh -huh. and then operations becomes your second problem immediately. Yeah. And so systems and processes help you get out of that for sure. Also understanding how to position your services in a way that isn't so customized and just completely from scratch every single time. Mm -hmm. You don't have to go full blown like productization, but at the same time, you need to have some sort of cohesive structure. It also helps in your marketing because you can more succinctly define who you solve problems for and how they're solved. And yeah. so you tie those together, that cuts down a lot. Ultimately, in my opinion, a solopreneur must ultimately figure out a way to leverage. And that's something that I think differentiates solopreneurs because that's a common question. I get, well, what's the difference between a solopreneur and a freelancer? And they can be very similar. Solopreneurship can look a lot like freelancing sometimes. Mm -hmm. Like there's no question. Sure. I don't think freelancing looks like solopreneurship if solopreneurship is defined appropriately. But you know, freelancing, it's it's a lot more like, yeah, I have a client, they hand me projects, it's kind of put into a nicer package and I just sort of it's it's a little bit more commoditized, right? Now those relationships over time feel a lot less commoditized when they're done well. And that's really cool. Sure. And I, I love freelancing. I think it's the gateway to solopreneurship. Um, I know people making well into the deep six figures freelancing and they work 20 to 30 hours a week and are super happy. So I'm, I'm not going to tell anybody that that's not a right place to be for them if that works. Um, but if you want to branch into solopreneurship, that preneur, <laughs> Art, <laughs> right. you know, it means you are building something that sort of lives and exists beyond just your ability to swing a hammer. And that's really what freelancing doesn't do. You're paid when you hit that nail. Mm -hmm. And so the preneurship is about leverage at the end of the day. And what that means is you either have the ability to bring in other people. And that's what a traditional company does, except we don't put them on the payroll. We keep them as external contractors. Right. That's one form of leverage. And then the other is productization. Ultimately, you could productize the service or you can go full blown information products, you mm -hmm. know, and that's that's really full circle to close all this out. That's kind of where I am now is after, you know, like you, a book, like a course, like a video. Yes. Yeah. Those, those kind of info products. Yeah. Something that you can make once and sell a number of times. Yeah. And you get to a certain point in your career when you turn into old people like us, <laughs> you're like, Hey, I need to start helping the next generation. You know, I've accumulated a lot of knowledge and I see these other folks who are struggling and I can offer them insight. I can help them. Mm -hmm. And to me, it's almost, um, a duty at this point. Plus I also am just so completely, I mean, again, if somebody went to my website, I mean, that's my initial opening thing on my personal website is like, this is how I see the future. And mm -hmm. I really do believe fundamentally that this is where our economies are going, where more and more people have fragmented, uh, in, but yet interconnected networks of people who specialize in things. And we grow and work together and corporations and all the way down to small mom and pop shops are all comfortable and understand this is how it works because we built it in a way to still serve their needs. And suddenly the overheads, the excess, the junk that people don't need and don't even want are irrelevant. And they're just looking for complete utter solid value, mm -hmm. you know, and that's where the solopreneur shines. Cause again, we can get the same work done for half the budget and not sacrifice quality. 
that's music to a lot of CMOs ears and every other person like small business onward. So, um, at the end of the day, that's the future that I want to see for people. And I also have a very personal kind of tie to that, which is, I just believe that society is built on people who are self-sufficient and value their own independence and ability to have agency for their own choices is just a healthier society in general. So I'm very driven by that as well. Yeah. Something I've talked about in my last couple of keynotes is this concept of, um, last year I experienced so much personal freedom in how I had structured my, what I would now call solopreneur business that as I was making goals for next year, I was like, I don't, I don't want to put anything on this list that's going to take away from the freedom bit for me. So that's more than, more than income, more than anything else, more than, uh, an impressive logo to put on my website, more than, uh, a, a project that I really get to flex my creative skills. Like the freedom thing is number one. Those other things still matter to me, but the freedom thing is, is totally number one now. And I'm, I'm curious, you know, there might be somebody listening or maybe lots of people listening who are like, maybe I need to hire that Tory guy to, to coach me. And they're probably really good and really bad fits for this. How, how do I know if I'm a, if I'm a, uh, a solopreneur in the future or a future solopreneur, how do I know if it's too soon for me? Or how do I know if like coaching would be helpful for me at this point? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, spoiler alert, my limited clientele list policy exists very much in the one on one. <laughs> it's like, true with coaching. So also. I hope there isn't a lot. Yeah. Um, so we might be out of seats. Uh, <laughs> sorry. But in theory. No. Yeah. No, I, I think. <laughs> or, um, or maybe to say that differently, how do, how do I know if it's too early for me to hire a coach? Yeah. that I think that's a fundamentally good question. And I yeah. think that there's a, there's an argument for me that like, look, if budget wasn't a concern, then it's not too early. It's never too early, but there is something that happens with people who over rely on coaching and external validation, external direction. Yeah. There has to be a level of skin in the game for yourself where you are taking those risks on your own. You're getting beat up. You're experiencing that failure alone. There's something of merit to all that hell that we go through and learn from. And sometimes a coach isn't going to keep that from happening anyway. I mean, the, you know, but at the same time, there's an element of, I think you're right. There's a right moment when it makes sense. And for me, I think perhaps in a perfect world, there would be coaches for every stage, you know, where you're starting up. And again, if you've amassed a huge amount of capital and you've built a network and you're like, I'm ready to start this solopreneur thing. You know, I, I could live for a year without money. If I need to, I need a coach who can help guide me through. That's very different than somebody mm -hmm. going, I'm strapped for cash. I just lost my job. And you know, now I need to figure out what to do. Um, so I suppose if I were to answer that question, I think once you start to exhaust all of the free information that's out there, mm -hmm. there are so many co courses, cohorts, you know, just YouTube <laughs> free information that can get you started and up to a certain level of competency and experience where the coach's influence will actually matter. It's yeah. almost, so I use a, an analogy that I really enjoy. Uh, it's like, it's a Velcro analogy. So if you know how Velcro works, you have hooks and you have loops, right? That's what makes the whole system work. And I talk a lot about like, well, if you don't create the loops, there will be nothing to hook to when the hook comes along. Yeah. And that sort of falls under this principle with me. Like if you don't build those loops early on by making the mistakes and working hard to try and like grow on your own and learn and do all that due diligence and all that effort up front, there won't be a lot for that coach to kind of hook to. You'll be shooting in the dark. And I think this is speaking to another gigantic benefit of solopreneurship, which is you do not have to wait until you're on your own to start it. That's like one of the dumbest things I see people do is like, oh, I didn't think about it until I lost my job. I didn't, I right. hate, I mean, so many people hit me up and they're like, I got to get out of my job. Okay, cool. Like you can survive for a while. You have a job. Okay, mm -hmm. that's cool. So let's start building. Uh, I just feel like I got to get out and then I can start building. I'm like, ah, not a good idea, despite the fact that that's kind of what I did. <laughs> but I saved up years of capital. It was very intentional, you know, mm -hmm. and plus, plus, by the way, I didn't fully do that. So um, I think the right time happens when you have exhausted or at least fully immersed yourself in the realness of it mm -hmm. and proven yourself to yourself, you know, a little bit to go, okay, I'm ready now for a guide. I hope that answers the question a little yeah. bit better. 
Uh, so shifting gears a little bit, um, you know, in all of your different roles, both as a as a coach and an employer and as a mentor and as an employee, I'm sure you've gotten lots of great advice and some that you've shared with other people. Do you have a favorite piece of advice either that you've received or that you like to pass along to others? Oh, man. I, I can be like a, um, an advice vending machine. <laughs> it's a, You're like it's a, a magic eight ball. Yes. I was, it's a strength and a weakness. Um, you know, I, I, I think I'm going to share what I'm pretty sure is the most common advice that I've ever given. And this is not going to come across as solopreneur advice, but it's very much solopreneur advice. And that is, you've heard me say this a million times. If you believe them when they tell you it's great, you have to believe them when they say it sucks. So I say, don't believe them at all. And in the world of professional creativity, where I've literally created thousands of pieces and every single one of them went to a client to give the thumb up or thumb down before it went to production, that might seem a little nuts. <laughs> right. And yet I stand by it. And the reason that I stand by it is when you fully let that lesson sink in, you come up with a question of, well, if I can't trust them, then how do I know if it's good or not? Mm -hmm. And that's my entire point is you have to learn that for yourself. You must figure out what's good or not, because mm -hmm. if you abdicate your self-worth in any way, shape or form, including professional creativity to some critic, you are abdicating your own personal value to somebody else. And I find that to be a recipe for disaster down the line. Yeah. I, I have heard you say that a hundred times and I was going to be shocked if that wasn't the piece of advice that you shared. <laughs> uh, and I, I think just to add on to that, like it's, it's not necessarily that <clears throat> if they say it's great or that it's bad, that they're wrong, but you have to know. Exactly. And if like, then you're just at their whim. Exactly. If you don't know how many so approved or signed off on or sold is different than great. That's right. You could do some really professionally bad work. <laughs> That's and right. it can still get approved and printed and out in the world. Yeah. Yeah. How many times have we seen marketing directors who would approve utter garbage? Yeah. Because they don't know any better. Right. And then others whose standards are out of control for the budget, right? And right. everything in between. I like to think in terms of like music. How many incredible albums have been created where you could go back and read the critiques and it was oh, just right. nonsense. Uh -huh. And, and the, the, the reason why I should add this that is important is we all love the praise. Mm -hmm. We love it. And we're told, but ignore the critics when they tell you it's not good. <laughs> and what I'm saying is you don't get to choose that. When you open that door, there's one door into that room. And it could be a room with a red light that says bad or a green light that says good. But that door has one room. And when you open that, you're abdicating the whims of whoever flipped which switch on the inside. Yeah. And that I, I, again, I reject that. Tori, you have worked on lots of things and now you're saying no to many things so that you can work on solopreneur things. Uh, do you have any dream projects left? Anything that you're like, man, I just want someday I want to design or build or, or work on X. You know, <clears throat> one of the, one of the things that actually excited me the most when I started thinking about branching out and doing my own thing is I'm now truly 100% my own brand. Mm -hmm. And I know that might sound odd for a guy that was a solopreneur for, you know, <laughs> uh, over a decade and a half where of course I should have been my own brand, but I was being paid by other people. I was like a mercenary, you know, a uh, designer there. Man, that's a little too accurate. <laughs> I know. And so I feel like now I get to finally design for myself. I get to write my own scripts. I get to make my own after effects animated intro thing. I get to do that for me. Right. You know, and that's exciting. So yeah, I guess if, if I'm answering my, my dream project is myself and it's going, <laughs> it's going well so far. I'm happy with it. Seems very healthy. Good I work. think there's something probably <laughs> for psychologists to unpack there. <laughs> I love it. Uh, well, maybe your answer for this one, maybe that was a giveaway for your next question. A question I ask everyone on the show, Tori. And this can be life or work or design, whatever you want. But what would you say you find that you are most obsessed with right now? Without a doubt, I am most obsessed 
with having the freedom in every day to spend it with my wife and my kids. And you sometimes. <laughs> we typically have to be in a different state to hang out together, but uh, yeah. So this we made an exception this time. That's right. Since you drove up from Kentucky to Michigan, <laughs> as we'd like to joke. Oh, we could probably dig into the solopreneur thing in much greater depth, but for the benefit of our listeners, we'll we'll let them have some bite sizes of this for today. Um, but before we let you go, tell our audience where they can find you on the interwebs. Well, um, torydolly.com, I suppose is a good place, um, to find everything. Um, I have been building my network mostly on Twitter at, at Tori Dolly, um, small presence on LinkedIn and Instagram too, that will be expanded this year. Um, but for the most part, yeah, they go to torydolly.com. They'll find everything from there. And if they want to find examples of that super hot work that you finally got around to posting, where's that at? Sandpaperstudio.com. That's the design company's name. Yep. Excellent. Well, Tori, always a pleasure, sir. Thank you for gracing the microphone. It's been fun, brother. Yeah. It's about time. And thank you for being obsessed with design. You're welcome. Well done. <laughs> Thanks, man. Okay, kids, that's episode number 176 in the books. For all of today's show notes, head over to obsessedshow.com. Add your email address to our newsletter. I'll update you on some of my favorite new episodes and some cool things I find in my daily obsessions. Of course, all the links are over at obsessedshow.com to all the places you can find this show, iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, Google Play, and Spotify. So no matter where you find your podcasts, chances are you can listen to Obsessed Show from there. Just head over to obsessedshow.com. The Obsessed Show is produced by yours truly, Josh Miles. To have me speak or MC at your next event, head over to joshmiles.com to learn more. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.